Amen. All right, let's begin reading there in Romans chapter number 5, verse number 1. The Bible says this. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, Romans chapter number 3, um, if you were to look up this commentary by practically any theologian, it doesn't matter of what stripe or sort that he is, Presbyterian, it doesn't matter what he is. It's always the justification by faith chapter. Now, I would agree with that 100%, but you know what Romans chapter number 4 is as well? Justification by faith. That's what Romans chapter number 3 and Romans chapter number 4 both deal with. He begins in Romans chapter number 3 by explaining that we're all sinners, and then he concludes. Therefore, we conclude <clears throat> that a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law. But then he goes on to give supporting scriptures of actually examples of justification by faith in the Old Testament. That's exactly what takes place. So he concludes his argument and proves it, and then he just says, now here's more supporting examples of people who were actually justified by faith according to the Scripture. That's what Romans chapter 4 is. And the proof of that even further is that he concludes, or he begins chapter number 5 by saying, therefore. So everything we were talking about before was, therefore, being justified by faith. So Romans chapter number 3 and Romans chapter number 4 really are justification by faith chapters. That's the, that is the context of those chapters. <clears throat> so it says, therefore, being justified by faith. And we know that faith alone, he just got, got done explaining that, not of works. We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. So we're going to notice here in verse number 1, verse number 2, that Jesus Christ is spoken of as the mediator. Notice it says there, we have peace with God, and then he says, through our Lord Jesus Christ. And the only way to God, the only way to the Father, we know is, is through Jesus. Look at verse 2, he says it again, by whom also we have access by faith. So what do you think of when you think of getting access to something? Right? You think of maybe like a key or maybe like a door. And what did Jesus say that he is? He said, I am the door. What does he mean by he's the door? He's saying he's the way. Like if you want to get into that room from here, the way there, what's the middle part? What's the mediator? He, it's, he's saying that we have access into this grace wherein we stand. So how do you get into that grace? <coughs> by Jesus. He says, by whom? The object of the sentence was Jesus before that, the Lord Jesus Christ. By him also we have access by faith into this, into <coughs> this grace where we stand. So the grace is offered, but how do you actually receive the grace? It's by faith. That's when it's given. So it's by, uh, excuse me, by faith into this grace wherein we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. So he says we rejoice in hope of the glory of God. Verse number three, and not only so, saying we don't only rejoice when things are going well, we don't only rejoice when it feels like there's hope or there is hope. He says, and not only so, but we glory in tribulations also. What does he mean glory? He means like praise or giving joy. He's basically repeating himself when he says rejoice and then glory. He was repeating himself. So right here he's saying not only so, not only do we glory or do we rejoice in hope, but we glory in our tribulations also. Perfect example of that, of that is if you look at the apostles. I love that stories are told of Christians in the Bible, not just statements, because then you have examples of people you can lean on. And when you understand, like sometimes we can kind of get detached from reality when we're reading the Bible, but they're men just like you are. Exactly like you. Nothing different. You know, obviously with Jesus Christ, there's a major difference because God and man, he can still relate to us. But we're talking about Peter, Paul, these guys, all of the apostles, all of the disciples. They are 100% man, no different than you at all, period. Right. So when you see them going through things, you see them literally being beaten. It says they go away, what? Rejoicing. Exactly what it says right here, talking about rejoicing, saying not only do we joy or praise God or give glory to God in hope when there is hope, right? When Jesus is walking with them, but they also, once he's gone and they're being beaten, literally, cast into you know, prisons, just being treated horribly when they're going through tribulations, they glory as well. So you see a perfect example of that being spoken of right here. <clears throat> but, and he says, and not only so, but we glory in, <coughs> in tribulations also. This is important, knowing. Pay attention to what he's teaching right here, knowing. So he's telling you, 
why it's good to glory in tribulations also. Why is it good when, something's, when something is bad that's come about in your life, when maybe friends have di disfellowsh disfellowshipped you, family has disfellowshipped you, something bad has happened in your life for the cause of Christ? This is why you should glory in that tribulation, knowing that tribulation worketh patience. So you should understand knowing, hey, I'm growing as a Christian. I, I know that tribulation, when he says worketh, <coughs> he's saying like works like produces. A lot of times you see the word when it says worketh, it's oftentimes we would substitute that like for producing. It's, it's creating this. It's creating patience. Now, the word patience oftentimes in the Bible isn't exactly how we would use the word patience today. It's very similar, but it's, it, there is a difference. It talks about the patience of Job. It, it, it has more of like an enduring slant. Knowing that it's, it, it, when right here when it talks about knowing that tribulation worketh patience, what does Jesus say that those that, he talks about those that endure to the end, right? He says that, that f their flesh would be saved, Right? And then you know what he talks about in, once you start reading in Revelation, he said, Revela the book of Revelation, Revelation, the book of, that's Kentucky come out, the book of Revelation, this is South too, man, the book of Revelation, it talks about how, it says, he, this is the, uh, the patience of the saints. What is he talking about then? Them enduring. So the word patience in the Bible, it, it almost always is talking about enduring. It's not exactly the same as we would use patience. It's actually, it is referring to like, it's not just the state of mind of, you know, that you're just being, you're patiently waiting on something. It's you're enduring through that. So it, it's creating, you know, endurance within you. The ability to be able to endure. <coughs> Tribulation <coughs> worketh or creates like patience. And he says this, and this kind of plays hand in hand with that. And patience, watch this, experience. Because that endurance, you know, you're, it, or that patience, it's creating that actual experience like a skill because it's something you are doing. And tribulation work with patience and patience experience. Now watch this. And experience hope. Now you notice that's what we started with. He said that we, he said we rejoice in, in hope of the glory of God because hope is what we're saved by. Hope is faith, right? It's synonymous. I've heard, you know, uh, uh, people try to debate this. Uh, I, there was an actual debate on the subject of the word hope that I watched one time. I have no idea why I watched that, but it was on just that word, in the, and they went back in the Greek and everything. And it settled for me because I'm King James only, and the Bible says that we're saved by hope. I mean, it's plain as day. So the hope that is seen, you know, uh, the hope that is seen is 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 uh, not hope. What is, for what does he have hope for? I can't remember exactly where it's located, but that's basically what it says. You're saved by hope. That means it's faith. So I don't need to hear a debate on the Greek and what it says. So right here, that's why it's so important that, that when he's talking about hope is because it's referring to the faith that you have, right? And he says, so basically he says here, we don't only glory in our, when we have faith, when we're, when, we're, when we're filled with faith and it's easy to have faith, when things are going well, he says we glory in tribulations also. And why? Knowing that tribulation worketh patience and patience experience. And then watch what he says, we're back to hope and experience hope. He's saying, you know why? It's because that it's all, it's all going to build our faith. It's going to make us stronger in faith. You know why it's good to, to glory when you're going through tribulation? Because at the end of it, you're going to have stronger faith. That's why it's good. It's going to help you. And then you know what? When you go to encounter your next tribulation, you're going to be even stronger. It's going to be even easier to fight through that because you have experience now, right? Because you've gained patience. You've gained the ability to be able to endure through things like that. And now you have stronger faith. <laughs> experience and experience hope. And then he says, and hope maketh not ashamed. That means that, you know, the stronger your faith is, the less ashamed you're going to be of what you believe, right? So that's exactly what he's explaining. And hope makes, I mean, it, it causes you to not be ashamed. Hope maketh not ashamed because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost which is given on us. We can see that <coughs> all throughout the New Testament. 2 Corinthians chapter number 1, that whole chapter is about, you know, the comfort of the Holy Spirit. That that's one of the reasons why we're given the Holy Spirit is to comfort us. That's what Jesus referred to it as. You know, he said, I will come to you, by the way. Look at verse number 6. For when we were yet without strength, in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. Say, he wasn't late, it was the perfect timing. Perfect timing. When we were without, yet without strength, saying, 
You know, we didn't have any strength, and then he explains why. Well, he tells you in the end of that passage as well, in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. Because <laughs> we're all ungodly. He just got done explaining that in Romans 3. <clears throat> Look at verse 7. This kind of <clears throat> gets very meaty here in just a moment. Romans chapter 5, there's about three or four verses where the grammatical structure is probably the, the hardest passage in the entire Bible to understand as far as the grammar. And, you, and I, I've heard many people discuss that. I've, I've, if you ask almost anyone that's very familiar with the Bible, you know, you, and they've read the Bible multiple, multiple times, what's the hardest part of the Bible to understand? There's a few verses in Romans chapter number 5 as far as the grammar, just understanding what, even what it's saying, the, the, the point that it's conveying. It's not that it's deep doctrinally, it's just very hard to get across. And this is kind of beginning that context right here in verse number 7. So he says, for scarcely, that means like rarely, <clears throat> for scarcely for a righteous man will one die. Saying it's very rare <coughs> to find someone that would even die for a righteous man. So you have a man that's like perfect and righteous. He's of very good quality, right? He's a good person. He's saying it's very rare that somebody would even die for him who's righteous, who's perfect. And then he says, yet, per, per, per adventure, he's saying perhaps... For a good man, some would even dare to die. He's saying, yeah. He said, so he says in the very beginning there, for scarcely for a righteous man would one die? He's saying it's rare. And he says, yeah, but perhaps maybe for a good man, maybe some would, would, would dare to die. They would think about dying. Then he says this, would dare to die, but God commended, commended his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners... <clears throat> Christ died for us. So he really expressed his love for us or showed us his love because he not only, he didn't die for a righteous person, he didn't die for a good person, he died for a sinner. He died for, and he just called us a moment ago, ungodly. So that showed us how much he, he really truly did love us because he was willing to even die for a bad person. That means you love that person a lot, right? If you're willing to die for them and they're not even a good person, that means you really must love them. When he says God commendeth, I will oftentimes when I'm explaining this verse, I will use, especially out soul winning, especially if it's, if it's a person that's much younger, that doesn't, you know, doesn't seem like they wouldn't understand uh, the, the, you know, a deeper definition of this word. I just, think, I just say that means he showed us his love, which is correct. <clears throat> but it's kind of a shallow definition of that. You know, have anyone ever heard of like a letter of commendation? Maybe if you're transferring from one job to another job, they'll give you a letter of commendation. I know it exists in the military and things like that. A letter of commendation is like a letter that's proving something. It's like proof. It's like, it's, it's, here's the record, right? So he's saying God commendeth his love toward us. Like he proved his love is more or less what that really is speaking about right here. That he proved his love. He didn't only show it. But he proved it. So it's, it's more of a, the, a deeper definition of that is that he proved his love toward us. In that, so this is how he proved it again, <clears throat> while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. The point being that we are not righteous, we're sinners, and he was willing to die for us, showing that he, he must have loved us. Much more than being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. So he's saying much more than... Being now justified, now that we're justified, he's saying now that we're righteous, because we're made righteous in him. He's saying if he was willing to die for us, even when we were sinners or even when we were ungodly, how much more, you know, should we be saved from wrath through him now that we are justified, now that we are made righteous? And he says, for if, he explains that same idea that I just explained, for if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God... By the death of his son, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. So this is a, you know, a, it, it gives a, a perfect concept of how it works when Jesus Christ died. He already paid for all the, this, this right here disproves, this concept disproves. And it's funny because Calvinists often find a lot of their passages in the book of Romans. You know, Romans 9, Romans 11, Romans 5 even, they, they try to teach total depravity, Romans 5, Romans 3. But this concept is disproving Calvinism because he's saying that we were reconciled beforehand and he's explaining, it just shows they don't understand what the passage is actually teaching. We were reconciled beforehand in the sense that he died for us 
and paid for all of our sins, but we hadn't accepted that reconciliation yet. Now that we are recon actually, actually uh, reconciled, now that we have received that justification, he's saying how much more now should we be saved from wrath through him? So look at verse number, uh, we'll continue there, verse number 11. <clears throat> and not only so, but we also joy in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom we have now received the atonement. Notice everything goes through Jesus. You know, over and over again, you keep saying that. And not only so, but we also joy in God through. Uh, so how do we joy in God? It's through Jesus Christ. Through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom we have now received the atonement. To, to atone for something is like to sacrifice for something. <clears throat> Our sins have been atoned for. They've been sacrificed for and paid for, basically. Verse 12. Wherefore, as by one man, sin entered into the world. So who was the one man that committed the first sin, that caused sin to enter into the world? Who specifically is it referring to? Obviously, Eve was the very first person. But here, you know, it's speaking of the man because he's the head of the household. That's what's always referenced. You know, he's the one that was specifically given the commandment, all of that. So who's the man, of course? Adam, right? Wherefore, as by one man, this is where this context really, it really it was, it was beginning before it was more of the preface to the context. Now it begins. Wherefore, as by one man, talking about Adam, sin entered into the world. <clears throat> so he caused sin. To, this world was sinless. This world was paradise. It was perfect. It was as if it was heaven. But after that, the curse entered into the world, right? He says, and death by sin. And so death passed upon <coughs> all men. And why did death pass upon all men? For, is it because, this is, the, this is also, this proves the teaching of total depravity. They think that just everyone, you know, you don't need, they basically teach you're just totally depraved when you're born. Like babies are. Catholics even teach this. That's false. That's not what this teaches. Why has death passed upon all men? For, because all have sinned. Because we're all sinners, that's why. <clears throat> and so death passed upon all men, for, because that all have sinned. And then he explains something right here. A lot of people confuse this verse too, and we are going to compare. This is probably the only time we'll compare Scripture to Scripture during this. It says in verse 13, For until the law, sin was in the world. Talk about the law that Moses gave, right? <clears throat> sin was in the world, and then he says this, but sin is not imputed when there is no law. Now, verse 14 is key. Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses. So were people still sinning? So what people will do here, let me explain this first. In verse 13, they'll say, for until, this is a dispensationalist. We'll kind of use this to teach false doctrine here. For until the law, sin was in the world. So they're saying until the law was given, there was sin in the world. But then they say, but sin is not imputed when there is no law. Also, people will, will say, they'll kind of, and they, they, this, they have to disregard all of Romans 2 to say this. They'll say, see, if someone isn't given the law, like actually taught the commandments, <clears throat> then that person isn't liable. They're not accountable for their sin. But the problem with that is that everyone has the law. Because you either have the physical law, is what it's referring to, and oftentimes the Bible just says, the law, speaking of the book of the law, Right? And, but even if you don't have the book of the law like the Jews had, what do you have? What did Romans 2 tell us? You have your conscience, and then you also have the law written in your heart. Remember, it's two different things. They have the law written in their heart, their conscience also bearing witness. So you have the law there, and then your conscience bears witness to that. So when somebody tries to tell you that with that passage, just go back and show them, hey, Jew and Gentile, everyone. There, there, isn't, there aren't these people, these groups of people or nations or something that are just without the law. It doesn't work like that. Now, but he says, but I want to focus on there for a moment when it says, but <coughs> sin is not imputed <coughs> when there is no law. Now, there is one exception to this of people where there is no law. Does anybody know what it is? Does anybody have any clue? Go to Romans chapter number 7. Romans chapter number 7. <coughs> Look at verse number 7. What shall we say then? Is the law sin? God forbid. Nay, I had not known sin, but by the law. For I had not known lust, except the law had said, Thou shalt not covet. Now, Paul's talking about himself personally, right? When do you think that he first received that? 
when he was 30? No, of course, when he was a child, right? Look at the next verse. But sin, <clears throat> taking occasion, watch this, by the commandment, that's the law, right? Wrought in me all manner of concupiscence, for without the law, sin was dead. When, when was he without law? Right? Before he, he had received the commandment. Look what it says, verse 9 is really what, the, what we needed. For I was without, I was alive without the law once, but when the commandment came, sin revived and I died. He's talking about the first time he sinned in his life. When he was given the law. It's kind of like you said when the commandment came. I always think of like, oh, it just came to me. It's like when you kind of understand it or you get it for the first time. There's a time in your child's life, in your life, when you were taught something or when something happened, when you were four, five, six years old, <clears throat> and all of a sudden you just understood. That's not right. It's not only not right for my mom, just because my mom and dad tell me, like, you understand there's a point where you get to, because obviously your children, you just tell them, no, don't do that. In the beginning, they're just obeying you just because they don't want to spank it, or they're just obeying you just because they know you don't want them to do it, and they know it's not you know, good because you've said so. But there's a point when you realize that there is a moral, a, a, a moral standard, a law that is right or wrong, and that lying is just not okay to do. It has nothing to do with whether your parents tell you that or not. You know that's not right. You know it's not right to do these things. And whatever law that is that first comes to you, when that comes and you choose to break it, you die spiritually. That's why if a baby dies before that, again, debunking total depravity, that, that's why it says, for sin is not imputed when there is no law. Sin is not imputed upon a child. Why? Because there was no law for them to break in the first place. Adam and Eve would be a perfect example when they were in innocence. Sin was not imputed when there was no law. The law was given and they ended up breaking it, right? But when they were when when your child, you know, is in total innocence, sin's not imputed upon them at that time. You can see here in just two chapters later, he clears that up what he's talking about. If you go back to Romans chapter number five and you read that again, it makes perfect sense. He says, For until the law, sin was in the world. And then he just gives you this little snippet just to explain this small fact. But sin is not imputed when there is no law. <coughs> Verse 14, nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses. Why? What did it say two verses before that? For, for all of sin, right? I'm talking about because all had sinned. <coughs> death, it said in verse 12, and so death passed upon all men for that all has sinned. That's why death reigned from Adam to Moses. He's saying even before the law was given is his point. Adam to Moses. Even before the law was given, people were still dying because they were sinning, and they were sinning against the law in their hearts. That they already knew that it was wrong. I know I used Abimelech as an example when God came to him. He knew what he was doing because he tried to excuse it. Like the Bible talks about, your conscience will try to excuse or accuse one another. Immediately he's like, I didn't know she was his wife. Proving that he knew that it was wrong. If she, if she was married. <clears throat> that was before the law is why I brought that up just now. Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses, and he says, even over them that had not sinned after the similitude, that means the same, or similar, right? Look at it that way. The similitude of Adam's transgression, saying just because it wasn't the same exact sin that he did, even those that, that sinned, but it wasn't the, the, the same sin, death reigned upon them because they had broken God's law. Whatever that law was is what it's saying. They sinned in some way. And then he says, who, referring to Adam, who is the figure of him that was to come. So Adam was a figure of Christ, right? <clears throat> That's what it's telling you. Now here in verse 15, 16, and 17, I believe it's 17, he's going to explain to you <coughs> in what way they are similar, but also in what way they are different. Because there's a difference. And this is where it kind of gets complicated grammatically. So he says this, this ver the very beginning of verse 15 is when people get real confused. But not as the offense. Now first let me say this, offense just means sin. Look at, um, I know there's a verse in here. Verse 20, just for, we'll read this in a moment and I'll, I'll expound it then. But look at verse 20, I just want to teach you something from it. Moreover, the law entered that the what? Offense might abound. Now watch this, but where sin abounded. See, sin and offense are the exact same word. Look at what it says in verse 15. But not as the offense, saying not as the sin, talking about Adam's sin, so also is the free gift. Now, the word that messes everybody up here is also. It's, see, it's, it's, it's kind of 
In our language, we would not use, today we would not use the word also. So what he's saying is <clears throat> not as. So different than is what he's saying. Not in the same way as, as Adam sinned. That's how the free gift is. He's, he's basically saying this. The, the way that Adam sinned and the way that death, he's getting ready to explain, falls upon all men and how all died from the result of that sin, that Christ's atonement is different than that. He's getting ready to get into it. For if... Oh, I'm sorry, I skipped down. Verse 14. No, we are in verse 15. For, for if through the offense of one, he's saying the sin of one, <laughs> one person, <laughs> referring to Adam, many be dead... Much more, the grace of God <coughs> and the gift by <laughs> excuse me by grace, which is by one man Jesus Christ, hath abounded unto many. So first, let me point out the similarity. I want to make this very simple and easy. The similarity is that one man starts both actions. Adam started the act of bringing sin into the world, right? And then you have Jesus, who started. This is a complicated passage, so try to follow. Then you have Jesus who started the act of bringing righteousness or giving the free gift, right? But he's saying this, he's saying the difference is this, but not as the way that Adam did, not as the sin that he committed, so, also, so is the free gift. Not like he's going to explain a difference between the free gift. For if through the offense of one, through Adam's sin, many died, right? So he sinned, correct? And then what happened? The result of that was not only he died, but it brought sin into the world. The curse is now in the world. And then from that, it was like a domino effect of other people sinning and dying, right? So he's saying, not like that. Many be dead. He says, much more the grace of God and the gift by grace, which is by one man, Jesus Christ hath abounded unto many. The first difference that he points out in this passage is that Adam caused a curse to come upon all, while Jesus caused a blessing to come upon all. So that's the two differences that are being spoken of here. He says, because he, he says, for, the, for if through the offense of one, many be dead, saying everyone dies through his offense, right? Much more the grace of God. This is a positive, a blessing. Much more the grace of God and the gift by grace, which is by one man. So the similarity is by one man. Jesus Christ hath abounded unto many. An abundance, people, the Bible talks about that with blessings, right? Death, life. Curses, blessings. The common denominator is one man, right? That's how, and you know, it's funny because there are a lot of, um, a lot of figures in the Bible, you know, that is, this is referred to as the sub subject of typology, in, in, uh, if you're studying theology, of types of things. And you can talk about types of Christ, like topology of Christ, right? Well, there are, there are a couple instances where things that are righteous, like Christ, where it will be contrasted or figures will be used, like here with Adam. How there's a type, how Adam was a type of Christ in the sense that how he was the first person that brought sin into the world, right? And he brought a curse into the world. Well, Jesus brought a blessing into the world. So notice how he contrasts the two things there. It's interesting how he can use a type of something bad, but Christ can still be a type of that because he's good. It's through contrast, not through similarity. Do you understand what I'm saying? But there still is. The similarity is through the one man. But that's interesting. I've looked at things like that to me, and, and it's really interesting like, just how like uh, Jesus is the lion of the tribe of Judah. He's likened unto a lion, but then also what's the devil likened unto? So I've tried to do studies like that, and that's interesting to me when God will use, you know, types for both, you know. But then now look at the next verse, and this is the really hard one, it seems like, for people. Verse 16. And not as it was by one that sinned. So this is also a difference. <laughs> Even though he's a type, he, he first got done saying, you know, that he was a type of Jesus. He said at, at the end of, who is the figure of him that, which is to come. So after he says he's a figure, he's like, I'm going to explain to you a couple differences, though. Between the figures. <clears throat> While I explain to you the similarities. Verse 16. And not as it was by one that sinned, so is the gift. So he's saying, but there's also a difference between not as it was by one that sinned, so in this way is the gift. So here's another difference in the way that when Adam sinned, 
And he brought sin into the world. Here's another difference as when Jesus gave the free gift. And not as it was by one that sinned, so is the gift. For the judgment was by one to condemnation. <coughs> so he said, it was basically one man in a sense that condemned the whole human race is what he's saying. That's basically what he's saying. For the judgment was by one to condemnation. Now watch this. But the free gift is of many offenses unto justification. So do you want to know another way in which it was different? Not only, you know, you know, they're a figure, and there's differences, and not only is one difference that he brought, that Adam brought a curse into the world and, and Jesus brought a blessing into the world, but another one is this. Adam sinned, right, and brought in this curse. But he first was explaining how it was one sin, right? But <coughs> Jesus. When he came and died you know, on the cross and brought the blessing, did he only die for one sin? Because it was only one sin that brought all the sins and brought all of the, uh, the brought the curse into the world, right? Just one sin was a catalyst to all of it. That's what he's pointing out right now. He says, and not as it was by one that sinned, so is the gift. For because the judgment was by one person, he's saying, by one to condemnation. But the free gift, watch this, is of many offenses. So it was only one offense that brought all of the curse into the world and damned the whole human race. But guess what? The free gift isn't just for one offense. It's for many offenses. Amen. It's for all offenses. That's the contrast. He's saying that's the difference between, number one, so number one, they're a figure. They're, just, they're a type. Jesus is a type of Adam. But there are two differences is what he's explaining. Adam... By sinning, brought a curse into this world, but and it was through one man, he's saying. Jesus, who was also one man, brought a blessing into the world. Two totally opposite things, right? But they're still types. That's what he's saying. He's a figure of him, but he's a figure in the opposite way. Cursing, blessing. That's what he's trying to explain. That's what I was saying is interesting. That it's just the in, in the way that he's a figure is that he's an is the opposite. And, and he's also likened an Adam in 1 Corinthians 15. He's talking about the resurrection. You have the first Adam, and you have the last Adam, Jesus, right? Uh, it's cool, too. You know, he's referred to as the man Christ Jesus, I, I believe, in this passage. Which is by one man, verse 15, which is by one man, Jesus Christ hath about it unto many. But there in verse 16, you know, he says, <clears throat> let me finish explaining that. And not as it was by one that sinned, so is the gift. For the judgment was by one, just one offense to condemnation. One offense damned the whole entire human race. But the free gift, it's not just for one offense, is of many offenses unto justification. So that's another difference. That's a second difference is what he's saying. Is that his free gift is for not just one offense, for all offenses... And Adam's one sin cursed the entire world. But when Jesus blesses us, he takes care of all of our sins. And that's what this goes on to express. So if you don't understand this too, you won't understand why it keeps saying abound and abundance. It talks about that. <clears throat> Look at verse 17. For if by one man's offense, so notice he's still talking about the one sin, death reigned by one, much more... <coughs> They which receive abundance of grace. Notice the difference. It's one offense, but he's saying in this sense, it went, when you're given the free gift, so when you sin, it just takes one sin to damn you to hell, right? But when you're saved, is it just that one sin that's covered? No. Abundance. All of them. That's the difference, he's saying, between the sin, the curse of the law, and the blessing of righteousness. That he takes care of all of it. And not as it was by one that's... I'm sorry. For, for if by one man's offense... Verse 17 again. Death reigned by one. Much more they which receive abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness shall reign in life by one. Jesus Christ. How does that verse go? I know you memorized it in, in, in uh, the Mormon Bible. How does it go? When he talk, they try to re-quote Ephesians 2, 8, 9. Just what's the idea of it? We're saved by grace through faith after all. Yeah, but this, that just popped into my mind when I read this because it says abundance of grace. Why would you need anything else? It's like more grace. That's what abundance means. Like it's a bunch. Like it's more than what you need. You know what I mean? So it's like that doesn't even make sense at all. That, their verse popped into my mind, you know, when I was reading this just now. 
receive abundance of grace and of the gift <coughs> of righteousness shall reign in life by one, Jesus Christ. <coughs> so that gift is elsewhere referred to as eternal life. And here, what is the gift? Righteousness, right? Because, you know, when you're given salvation at that moment, I mean, that's a good feeling. You know what you're given? You're given righteousness. That the moment you believe on Jesus, I mean, that is, it's a hard concept. Sometimes it's clearer in your mind than others because it's hard, you know what I mean? But you are just like totally righteous after you believe on Jesus. Yeah. You're like when Jesus looks at you, you are literally like, like you've never committed a sin in your whole yeah. life. Like Amen. a sinless man, you know what I mean? Yeah. That's a cool thought, yeah. you know, to understand that. You know, when you believe on Jesus, you're given eternal life. You're never going to, you know, die. You're going to go to heaven. You're never going to go to hell. Amen. But guess what? He gives you righteousness. Where you are made. He imputes his righteousness upon you. Amen. Given Christ's righteousness. That's why Christ had to live that perfect life. You know, uh, <clears throat> like he told John, suffer it to be so, for thus it becometh us. Like we need to do this to fulfill all righteousness. He lived that righteous life so that he could give us that righteous life. It says, even so by the righteousness of one... Oh, I'm sorry, verse 17. And of the gift of righteousness shall reign in life by one, Jesus Christ. So the similarity is what? That they're both men, number one, right? That's obviously the similarity. You can see that by comparing it to 1 Corinthians 15. 15, you have the first Adam, last Adam, right? And they're, both, and they're referred to as both as men in that passage strongly in 1 Corinthians 15. But, and he's also called, you see, which is by, in verse 15, which is by one man, Jesus Christ. So a man brought sin into the world, and by one offense damned all of mankind. But then one man brought a blessing into the world, by one man, right? Which redeemed all of mankind. That's a, that's a cool thought when you think about that. That's the contrast, and uh, that's the, 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 the similitude. The contrast is, like I explained one more time, just so when you read this later, it's kind of a complex thought that you can remember. The contrast, number one, was that the actions of the first, which is Adam, he cursed the whole world. The actions of Jesus was he blessed the whole world. Number two contrast was that Adam, it only took one sin to damn the whole world. But Jesus, it wasn't only one offense that he covered, he covered all of them. It was an abundance instead of just one. That's the point. Those are the two contrasts, and that's what this passage is actually teaching. <clears throat> Uh, verse 18, therefore as by the offense of one, judgment came upon all men to condemnation. Even so by <coughs> the righteousness of one, so here's another similarity, the free gift came upon all men unto justification of life. I just thought of this too. This just destroys Calvinism as well. You know, false teachings are really easy to disprove. You, what's being compared here is how Adam damned all of mankind, right? And they would agree all of mankind's sinners because they have a doctrine called total depravity, right? But they have a real bad problem with this passage when it says this. Think about this. Therefore, as by the offense of one, judgment came upon all men to condemnation. They'd agree, yeah, by that judgment came upon all men. That all, all men are condemned. Even so, now hold on, in the same way. So you just agreed. That judgment came upon all men to condemnation. Even so, by the righteousness of one, the free gift came upon all men under justification of life. Think about that for a minute. That disproves Calvinism right there. Because they don't believe that justification is offered to all men. So if it says all men the first time, and that means that all men are condemned, and they say yes, well it says even so. So what you just admitted to, that you believe the first, pass the first part of that passage is teaching that all men are condemned... Well, the Bible says, even so, so in the same way, the free gift came to all men. Calvinism debunked again, just repeatedly. And they love the book of Romans, which is bizarre. Because it's just like, it debunks all of their false doctrine. <coughs> Verse 19. For as by one man's disobedience, <coughs> many were made sinners as a result of that, right? So by the obedience of one, shall many be made righteous. So he's again, he's, he's acknowledging the similarities. One man, one man. See how it keeps saying one man, one man, right? <clears throat> Verse 20. Moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound. <coughs> so he's talking about the law there. He is talking about the same thing we spoke about earlier because you remember he referenced Moses. He's talking about the actual book of the law being given. God gave the law, right? 
He's saying so the offense, so that the offense might abound. What does it mean when something abounds? It means it's more, right? If you have an abundance of something, it means you have more than you want. It means, number one, it's obviously a reference to, if you think of it in your mind like this, it's, it's going higher than, right? But he, this is also what I believe that this is teaching, is that to make it obvious. That's why he actually gave the law, was to make it even more obvious, so that the offense might abound. And also on Judgment Day, God can then reference the book of the law, right? It was written in your hearts all along, but guess what? I had a book that I had. That, and that causes the offense to abound. It says this, wherever the law entered, that's the whole reason why he gave the law. <coughs> that the offense might abound. <coughs> now watch this. But where, so you have the law here. You have sin abounding right above the law. There's more, right? <clears throat> but where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. Amen. So it doesn't matter. So you say, what if I kill someone? What if I do this? What if I do that? It doesn't matter because grace abounds more than that. Amen. Right? right? So if you're in, go back to uh, that verse that we just read just a moment ago. I just thought of this too. I was getting ready to say if you're in grace, and that's what it says in verse 2, by whom also we have access by faith. Watch this. Into this grace wherein we stand. So if we have access by faith into this grace wherein we are standing right now, then that grace abounds over all the sins that you commit. Because I'm in grace right now. Therefore it abounds. It wouldn't matter. Not to say, and he explains that here in just a moment in Romans chapter 6, verse 1. That doesn't mean you can just do whatever you want, but you could, and you could still go to heaven. Amen. Amen. Right. It wouldn't matter. Amen. You would, there would be repercussions, of course, but that doesn't matter. You would still go to heaven is what we're talking about. <clears throat> Moreover, the law ended that the offense might abound, but where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. That as sin, so in the same way, Sin reigned unto death. So sin worked, right? Death. It wrought death. That's what it's saying. It ruled death. <coughs> Even so, my grace <coughs> reigned through righteousness unto eternal life by Jesus Christ our Lord. It's so interesting that he goes into Romans chapter number 6, verse number 1, and he says this. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Do you know why he says that? Did, did you understand what I'm getting at right now? Do you know why he even has to say that? For the same reason when you're giving the gospel, and I hear it all the time. So what you're saying is, I can just do whatever I want and still go to heaven? Yeah. That's the whole reason he says that in Romans chapter 6, verse 1. He just got done saying, we're in grace, right? Because he says in verse 6 again, Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? The implication there is, number one, I, I brought this up to multiple people, even people that are sharp in their false doctrine, because people can know the Bible and be wrong. I brought this verse up. This is one of the verses you know, that I'll bring up to people sometimes about losing your salvation, and I'll ask them, Romans chapter number 6, verse number 1. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? I'll ask them this question. Is it possible for Paul to act, even ask that question and it to have any power or any meaning at all if you couldn't continue in sin and grace would abound? It's a nonsensical question then. If you couldn't continue in sin, then to, why are you asking the question? And then he actually answers it. God forbid we shouldn't. But guess what? We could. And that's the whole reason why he says that. Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Because he just got done explaining. Guess what? However much you sin, grace pays for all of those sins. Every last one of them. And this is, you know, what people will attack about easy believism. And they'll go after easy believism. Are you saying I can just believe in Jesus and do whatever I want? That's what the Bible teaches. That's right. what Paul taught. And Paul taught that, and guess what? He knew what people would say. And that's why he said, what shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. But guess what? If you wanted to, you could. And if people don't really grasp and understand that concept, it's probably because oftentimes they're not saved. You know, there can be babes in Christ that are very screwed up on something and they've already been very manipulated by some Pentecostal church that always just tries to jam, jam into their minds like you can lose your salvation. You can fall from grace. Brother Anthony and I were, were at this, you know what I'm going to say, don't you? We're at this guy's, we were going around knocking doors where I live in the ghetto. 
And, uh, and, and we knock on this guy's house that lives like right across the street from where I live. And uh, we were talking to this guy. And he asked one kid, you know, it's his door. And he asked this kid if he was saved. The kid was actually saved. <coughs> and then and there was like five guys there sitting around working on a car. Three guys. And he's just like, hey, what about you guys? And he's asking them, you know, if you die today, you know, you for sure you go to heaven. And the one guy that I'm going to mention here in a minute was actually saved too. The other guy was like not answering, kind of ignoring it. And then there was another guy there that was like, uh, <coughs> well, Brother Anthony referenced eternal life. Yeah, you're right, man. You know, because the guy gave the right answer and everything. He's like, yeah, once you're saved, you're always saved and stuff like that. And the other guy basically said, that was a huge mosquito or whatever that was. The thing was like that big. <laughs> and the other guy referenced like, uh, He's like, yeah, I grew up like Pentecostal Church of God because those are the people that are huge on losing your salvation. They're huge on it. And he's like, he's like, yeah, I grew up Church of God, Pentecostal, or Apostolic, I think he said. He's like, you can fall from grace. And this black dude that's standing there is like, he's like eating a burger or something. He's like, fall from grace? What? <laughs> he like looked over at the guy. It's stupid. It doesn't even make sense. Right. It's grace. You didn't deserve it in the first place. And then and Brother Anthony had the same feel that I did. I thought like an argument was getting ready to break out. Because he was pretty contentious the way he said it. And then the white guy just shut up. He just didn't say anything else. And we tried to talk to him and he wouldn't <coughs> talk to us or anything like that. But it's stupid. It's dumb. That, and those are the types of people that are always just, you know, they're so screwed up on salvation. And when they're a babe in Christ, sometimes even after they're saved in the very beginning, they've got to get rid of all that trash. But do you know why Paul even says, at the, he starts off, you know, Romans chapter 6, verse 1. He starts off his next thought when he was writing it. What shall we say then? Why? About what? Then, he's saying. Because of what he just explained. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? If you wanted to continue in sin, you could. Because grace abounds more than sin. I don't care how much sin you have. Or in what sins they are, right. grace abounds more than all of them. Amen. Every last one of them. Amen. Obviously, there are people that are reprobates, which are symptoms of the fact that they've already rejected God. But the Bible is still clear. All sin. Right. Grace abounds more than all of it. And if a saved person is in grace, that person can do whatever they want and still be saved. Right. right. Preachers, like, like pastors of these false churches, they would hate that statement. Right. But you know what? They hate the Bible's teaching on eternal security. Right. They hate the gospel is what they hate, really. Yeah. You know why? Because the light is always... Have you ever... I've never seen one of these churches that's like these mega churches, these super huge, big mega churches where they're real... And you got some proud guy. They're always these real proud guys. You never see them just like preaching a, just a, a super clear gospel ever. There are mega churches sometimes. You know, obviously there, you, you could say there are exceptions of people that like aren't on TV. I'm talking about popular mega churches. You know, popular mega churches. They will never do that because they want people to keep coming back. They want people. It's just like the same concept with the Catholic Church. Why the Catholic Church gain as much power as it did? Because it manipulated people into thinking you need us. You need to keep coming to the church. You need to keep staying in this state of. But you know what? The, uh, there are a lot of people, and I'm, I'm still speaking about the subject of people hating the true gospel. There are a lot of people that don't go to church at all. The majority, 90% probably, 95%, I don't know, maybe 99% of people that are saved on this planet today don't go to church regularly. Right. Don't live a, a godly life. Maybe live the exact same life that they lived before. But guess what? Where sin abounded, grace did much more about. Right. You know, much more about. And you know what? If there's anything that preachers need to be preaching hard about, anything that preachers need to be standing up and preaching to their con congregation about, they need to be you know, stepping on toes and making people mad about people preaching a false gospel. Yeah. Seriously. Why are people... Why are, our nation is almost all Christians, but guess what? Half of them, 90, no, not, not way, way more than half, almost none of them are saved. Why? Because they don't believe in the gospel of the Bible. They believe in a false gospel. That is sad. Right, right. 
That's, that's extremely sad. And it should make you mad that there are all these people that are, are using the advantage that they have to preach a false gospel for gain. Very often that's what it is. A lot of times, yeah, maybe the, the deceiver is the deceived. The Bible talks about, about that. But there's a lot of really evil, wicked people out there. And you know what? You should stand up for the gospel. You know what? And when, 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 you, when you speak to someone that's, that's been attending for a church for a very long time, and it's some Pentecostal church, it's some church that's just like preaching some hardcore work salvation, Catholic church, you know, Presbyterian church, whatever it is, after you get them saved, tell them like, <coughs> you need to stop going to that church. Did, did the church that you're going to, we're not trying to pack the house here. But we care about people, and we don't want them to continue in a church that was lying to them about their salvation. The most simple thing. Right. Tell them, hey, you know, did, did anyone at your church ever mention anything like this to you at all? Did they ever tell you anything like this at all about the true gospel? You know, no, they never did. Why would you want to keep going to, to a church like that? That's not even telling you the way to get to heaven. Because I, I don't, you know, I want to do away with all these false churches. Amen. I don't want them to have a congregation. I want those pastors to go get a job or do something else. Right. You know, get, get all these people out of their churches. Get them saved and make them uh, teach and preach in the truth and get them out of these churches. That's the worst problem. What's the worst problem amongst Christianity, Christendom? People use that as like a categorical word to speak of all of Christianity. Christendom. I'm talking about people saved, unsaved, just any a professing Christian. What's the worst problem? The, a false gospel. That's what the worst problem is because they all believe a false gospel. All of them. And you know what the true gospel is? And I embrace it. I don't care. Easy believe it, believism and once saved, always saved. Amen. That's what the end of this chapter is. Yeah, the other verses, Romans chapter number 3, verse number 28, is one of the clearest, maybe the clearest verse in the Bible, and it's not of works. And it's by faith alone. But you know the point of Romans 6 at the very end is? You can do whatever you want and still go to heaven. That's the point of the chapter. If it makes you mad, if it bothers you, if you think, oh, you're just going out and you're just creating, you know, all of these just like uh, anarchists against God, all this stuff, then you're an enemy of the true gospel of Jesus. You are, really. That's what people say. You're teaching people to just like live these evil, wicked lives. No one does that. Every person that I've ever been with in here that, that get, goes out, that gives the gospel, they always explain to people very, very carefully, hey, I, you know, people always use the statement, and I don't know why I don't like it because it's redundant. It's good to be good, right? If you said that, don't worry. It's not a big deal. It's just redundant. I, I don't know. I try not to say things that are redundant. It's good to be good, right? I always say things. You know, it's good to do the right thing, right? That's redundant, too. I didn't even notice that before. But here's the thing. You know, Everyone here explains to people like, hey, you know, it, you, when you shouldn't be sinning, right? You shouldn't live a sinful life. But if you did, they already know that anyways. It's not like these people leave, leave and they're like, oh, so God's happy if I just go kill somebody, huh? People aren't stupid. That's just their way of just like having like some sort of like ammunition back towards the true gospel. You understand what I'm saying? They want to say something back to you like you're just causing problems by saying that. But it's like, number one, okay, but, but here's the problem. Is it true, though? Even from your perspective, you're just causing problems? What does the Bible teach, though? You understand what I'm saying? That's not a way to argue. It's kind of like that's the, like the same type of logic that people will say, like, I don't believe in God because he's mean. It's like, yeah, but is he real, though? You're not really dealing with the problem. You understand what I'm saying? They're like, yeah, you, you know, what you preach is just, it just, it just creates issues. Is it what the Bible teaches, though? I don't care what you think if it creates issues. Your understanding is wrong about that? Let's talk about the Bible. You know what the Bible teaches? Easy believism, justified by, justified by faith alone, where sin abounds, grace much more abounds. Can you continue in sin? Yes, you can. Grace would abound, should you? God forbid. Right? You know, so it's good to, you know, obviously explain to people that concept, even, because it helps them understand the true gospel. But if you did never decide to go to church, if you did just live a sin, sinful life, <coughs> if you lied, 
If you even did something worse, which I don't think you do this, I always say those types of things to people. If you murdered someone, you know, if you did something like that, would you still go to heaven? I always ask those specific questions. What if you even committed suicide? Which I don't think you do that, but there are people that do. What if you did? Where would you go when you die? Where sin abounds, grace much more abounds. You'd still go to heaven if you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. The star has no word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father God, we thank you, dear Lord, <coughs> for the abundance of grace that was given, dear Lord. We thank you for, we thank you through the Lord Jesus Christ, because he's the mediator. He's the reason why we rejoice and in, in, in whom we rejoice. And he is, in, you know, the one that allows us to have access to the throne. He's the one that allows us to have access into the faith and the grace that is wherein we stand. We're just so thankful for the Bible, dear Lord, the, the, the physical word of God that we have in our hands, that we can, we can hold it in our hands, we can study it and read it every opportunity we get. Help us to stand up for the true gospel, for the, the, the gospel of the Bible, the gospel of Jesus Christ that the Bible actually teaches, and that it is once saved, always saved, and once you put all your faith in Jesus Christ, it doesn't matter what you do, and it is easy believism. All you have to do is just trust, put all your trust in you. Just help us to stand up for that. We love you so much. Uh, just give us courage to do so, to stand up for all of your word. In Jesus Christ's name, amen.